Welcome. Nice to have you here. This is the first session of our lab automation masterclass. The first of five, they're going to be every month on the first Wednesday of each month. And we're going to take you through all sorts of different considerations about how to get going with automation and some of the barriers that can stop you from automating things. So after this first introductory session, then we have three different se sessions looking at the various different things that can be troublesome when you're first automating before then our final session is very much about, okay, so where can this all take us? What are the most powerful experiments that we can do with automation? Um, I'm Marcus Kishater. I'm co-founder and CSO at Synthase, and I'm going to be your host for today's session. If you've attended any of our DOE masterclasses, welcome back. And if you're joining us for the first time, we're very excited to have you here. Now I'm excited to introduce our presenter for today's masterclass. Many of you might already be familiar with him from LinkedIn, where he's very active and a very strong automation proponent. So we have Daniel Yip, who's one of our scientific solutions consultants here at Synthase. Daniel, it's over to you. Cool. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Okay. Welcome to this webinar series where we really embark on a sort of a journey, what a journey with me uh, to explore the untapped potential of lab automation and take a glimpse into how cutting edge technologies available right now and the sort of innovative solutions are really propelling the scientific research to, to really much more higher and new heights here. So the topic I'm going to go through today with you is what is lab automation? We hear about it a lot. What does it really entail? Why the biosciences have to be automated? We then go through some use cases and uh, finally the barriers that overcome to, to get in lab automation. So first of all, automation is everywhere and we hear it all the time. Communities are being formed and there are also forums out there. One that was created by Seth Angola, so some of you may already know him, and he created this high lab robots org web space to really get all the enthusiastic automation engineers together. But there's a lot of collaborations as well with different vendors and it's all happening right now. It's going to expand ever more and it's definitely not leaving us. But what if lab automation? And I think no lab automation explanation will be complete without a video. And those that follow me on LinkedIn will know that I love posting videos about lab automation because it's awesome. And I have heard some people even say very mesmerizing to what it has that sort of a, what should we say, therapeutic effect as well. So here it is. This is a short clip of the Hamilton Micro Lab Star. It's actually in our lab in London. And it demonstrates what a typical setup can look like, especially for an Eliza, where you have plate washers and plate readers. But simply put, lab automation refers to really advanced technology, which revolves around robotics and software to streamline your lab experiments. It's important to really state here that it's not just a physical automation, but it's also software that facilitates the automation. Just for example, things like temperature monitoring systems or even booking and scheduling the use of the automation platform, such as company out there called Cluster Markets. So it's really about robotics and software put together, really encompasses the entire sort of lab automation and scope. So lab automation really plays a pivotal role in the biosciences. And it's no surprise that I'm a huge advocate for lab automation. But here's a question we have to ask ourselves, and that is why do biosciences have to be automated? Why is it so critical and important for us to use this and to advance in the field of biosciences? Here's the truth, and it may ruffle some feathers, but I'm going to say it, but manual experiment is really just so yesterday, and we should stop it. Now, of course, there'll be some experiments that absolutely have to be done manually, but if you can automate it and if there's already a proven use cases, then, you know, why are you still doing things manually? Why have scientists who have spent years in training, years in academic to understand the disease modeling and antibody targets, but then when they get asked, what do you do day to day, you're doing pipetting. This is what you really do just in the lab and staring in your tube, into your pipette into your tubes. And it can be very extreme. I've heard of stories of people spending weekends, late night shifts in the lab when actually they didn't need to. And, and there was already automated solutions out there that could have avoided them burning out. And there's a reason why this meme exists, right? It's because of the harsh reality. People are seeing scientists as just perpetuating all day in the lab. Now, biology has the potential to solve humanity's biggest problems. And the answer to those problems are all in these tubes here. And it's all done by hand. It's very laborious. And what happens is we start applying human limits on the science we can do and the progress we can make. And there are so many problems associated with what we are seeing here in, in this picture. But I'm going to point out some of the obvious ones. And an obvious one is that human error point. 
it's very easy to prepare to the wrong well, perpetuating mistakes, calculating the, the wrong stuff to go into these tubes. But what about the focus? Have you been in a situation where you are really focused? Someone taps you on the shoulder and asks where the rest of the stride pets are, and then you point to the direction of where they're located. And then you come back to experiment. And what happens is you're holding up a pet, like one, I'm having one here. There's liquid in the tip, and then you're looking at your, it's a drip ball, and you go, okay, I don't know where I left off with. So you realize that you actually have two options. One of them is to take the risk and guess, uh, but then you, know, you are going to compromise your results. The other option is to start again, but then you look at a time and you realize it's 4 p.m. and you have date night. And the chances are now, you know, you're not going to miss date night because your wife will get really angry. And as we all know, happy wife is happy life. But you're literally going to just uh, do this tomorrow. But that means all of the samples you've prepared are now perishable. They're gone. And so it's money not well spent and it's, it's time wasted just because of the spur of the moment of somebody tapping you on the shoulder. The focus is a really important one. And the other side is reproducibility. And that really impacts the robustness and validation. And we've all gone through this where person A and person B can have completely different results, even though they're running the same experiment, they follow the same SOP. Now, what about complexity? Why we need automation? Because everything is plate-based today. The workforce of most scientific experiments is all done on plates and they're just going to increase in resolution every few months. Can you imagine working in a three, four, five, six plate? The volumes are tiny, they're around two to five microliters. And so really pinpointing where you went from there is going to be insane. And the other side is that the color of the reagents. Now, sometimes we are lucky and the reagents do have color. So we're able to track back where they went. But most of the time they are colors and you end up trying to figure out where your liquids have gone. Like this poor scientist here trying to figure out where he last went. But it's a problem. And so now in your mind, you probably are thinking, yes, I agree. Life sciences need to be automated because you're running ever more complex experiments now. And you probably now are thinking that you want to automate everything, automate all the things. It's a good job. That's my part done in persuading you. And that by doing experiments manually is really bad. But when it comes down to lab automation, most of them people will ask is where can I start? I don't know what process I can automate. So give me some use cases so that I can start applying them now to what I do. And to be honest. Most applications can be automated. And if you're running uh, your R&D programs, then definitely automation should be at the forefront. So I'm going to show you at a very high level of where you can apply automation to. So there are three different types of automation in life sciences. We have the flexible automation. So devices that can be easily walked up to and used for any of the experiments. We have specialized, and these are automation equipment which are designed for very specific applications. And then we have the uh, integrated, and these are basically multiple different devices, multiple systems, all integrated with each other, forming a work cell for that full of sort of end-to-end -end automation. I'm going to go through some of the use cases of each one, and they are going to be from my own experience, so they can be subjective. But the idea here is to at least provide a starting point, or hopefully give you ideas of where you can start applying automation into your experiments right now. So flexible automation typically involves a standalone devices. They're easily accessible, as I mentioned before, and users can just walk up to and run it. And an area which this typically applies to a lot is in drug discovery and in assay development. So drug discovery, what is it? It's basically specialized tests to measure target activity or interaction between the compound and a biological target. Now, drug discovery plays a crucial role in identifying your potential drug candidates for various diseases. And it provides valuable insights as well to the drug and target interaction. One way to describe it in really layman's term of what you're doing is imagine you're, you're on a mission to uncover the secrets of a mysterious locked treasure chest that holds a cure for a really serious illness. And so you embark on this journey to find the key to unlock it. And the keys are these molecules that can open the chest. Where in the real world, these keys are the ones that can treat the disease. So what does it really mean practically? And what does it mean when you're applying the lab automation side? First of all, you are running an assay. And so the first thing is to figure out is what are the actual assay requirements? How many samples are you going to process? How many replicates? What are your libraries? How many reagents? What are the factor conditions? There's a lot to think about. So it's really important to get the requirements figured out. And that's really critical because it can guide you on picking the best lab automation equipment for it. 
we can't do this the other way around. Um, we can't be looking at lab automation first before knowing what we actually want to be doing. Once we figure that out, we can then think about the experiment design. And uh, if you are used to doing experiments manually, then there's a very high chance you're running experiments via one factor at a time, O factor for short. And that's bad. What's the point having a really powerful lab equipment in your hands, but then you still operate it like you would do it when you're doing things manually, you know, so running multiple experiments, testing one factor. It's really poor utilization of it. So once you've figured out the ASCII requirements, you've picked the device, what you should be thinking now is really around the sign of experiments, DOE. Now we have an entire webinar series based around DOE and can show you how to start, but DOE is going to really enable you to run experiments which are more statistically relevant and allow you to optimize the assay much quicker. The lab automation part it enables you to run these complex experiments because it's taken away the mundane task of repetting. Let it go crazy. Run that powerful 1536 run plate that you've always dreamed of doing, but wasn't able to because when you think about doing things manually, the mind explodes because it's too difficult to handle. Next comes robustness and reliability. And this is where the number of plates can scale and you essentially validate what you have confirmed from your optimized assay to now process different samples and ensure that the result is true. One other point to think about also is the tracking of samples, which is very common in this space as you go through high number of samples. Lab automation is there to do things more in a high throughput manner. So now the next challenge is to be able to figure out what the samples are and track them all back with the limb systems if you have one. And remember again, automation isn't just about the physical robotic device, it's software too. And that's why if you have these new systems in place, such as the limbs or EON, these are going to be critically important. Now there's obviously a lot more we can talk about, but I'm going to move on because I could be sitting here for hours talking about the different requirements uh, for asset development. Now, as I said before, asset development is the cornerstone of drug discovery. Research is trying to identify and validate their drug targets efficiently. And this is what we typically want to end up looking like, but this is on the like six old plate. You can see a heat map, lots of different conditions. Again, we're going back to DRE. So choosing the right equipment to accomplish this part is a very critical step. So let's take a look at the first category of devices. And these are the liquid dispensers. And they do one thing, as the name described, which is dispense liquid to a plate. But as you can see from the list there, each one is unique and suited for certain particular experiments. These devices are unique. So again, thinking about your specific requirements is important. Is it speed because your reagents are perishable? Is it high throughput because there's multiple plates and you're going to go through lots of different compound libraries? Or do you require a lot of flexibility because you have different configurations and your experiments actually quite bespoke? So you're looking for a multi-purpose device. So there's a lot to think about. But the first one we have here on the top layer is the Certus Flex. It has eight channels that can be equipped with different valves to facilitate the ideal dispensing of substances with different liquid physical properties, things like which are more in DMSO or more viscous. But dispensing is really simple. It has tubing and air pressure, and it can range from bottles to even tiny syringes, as you can see. All eight channels can dispense at the same time and with different volumes. And a common theme that I'm going to talk about a lot is speed. And just to give you an idea of how fast the surface flex is, is that it can fill five microliters in a three ball well in 11 seconds, you know, really fast. But what's great with the Certus Flex though, is the economics. So no extra consumables are actually needed. And I really like that flexibility of the device as well, because as you can see here, it can take in bottles. So you imagine you have a bottle that contains liquid that needs to be shaken. You can put that on the stirrer and that can be done for you. Or even radiants that have to be sat in an ice bucket. You can do that too, because the entire dispense mechanism just requires tubing to go into the solution and the Certus Flex takes care of that. So the inputs actually, whatever you have in your lab, it's a plate, it's a tube, it's a falcon, that can all be done. Another cool thing is that the channel heads that we see here has a configuration to have it angular. And it basically meaning that the samples are dispensed onto the side of the well, and this avoids bubble creation. So it's a really a nice bit of tech and innovation there. The next ones are from Formulatrix. So this is uh, the Mantis and the Tempest, and they use a technology that is kind of called this microfluidic liquid dispenser using a micro diaphragm pump. And basically what this means is that chips it designs can dispense discrete volumes. I actually have one right here. So these are the actual chips that they have. Your tubing goes in here and the volume comes out. Basically liquids go to the micro diaphragm and pump. But this is all you need, a tertiary tubing to go into the Mantis and into the Tempest to actually do the dispensing. 
Now, there are three different chip types. So there's a, a low volume chip that does 0.1 microliter, 0.5 from 1 microliter, and these indicate the actual pulse. So remember again, the Mantis and the Tempest dispense discrete volumes. So let's say, for example, if you wanted to dispense 0.3 microliters, then you use a low volume chip and it will do three pulses of the 0.1 microliter. So it's really accurate because of the way it, it does the pulse. We then have the high volume chip, which does 1, 5, 10, and 25. A continuous, which is 25, 50, 100, 200 microliters, and these are more used for backfilling larger plates here. The Mantis is an amazing device, actually, because if you plan to have a very complex experiment, which may use a lot of reagents, then, you know, the Mantis is really suited for that because it can hold up to 48 reagents. You can see there's a carousel there on the top right, and it's called the LC3 module, and each one can hold 24. We can have one on the left and one on the right, which enables you to have the 48 reagents. And also it's highly configurable with the left and right portions here. These chips, as I mentioned, takes tubes, but you can also add tips as well. So if you prefer to use a, a pipette tip or one mil, you, you can do that too. Now, because there's a lot more samples, that means the applications here are much broader. So as long as running assay development, you can do experiments such as ELISAs and even the PCR reactions. Another point I like about it is that the chips I mentioned has this RFID technology. So it actually can identify the chip that you've used and also the assigned liquid. So everything is assigned to the actual chip itself. In terms of the consumables, again, everything can be decontaminated and reused. So again, economically friendly. Now, now the bottom three here we have are the Echo, the TCAN D300E and the iDOT. And they're very similar. And that's why I kind of group them at the bottom. The Echo, as we've probably heard already, is an acoustic dispenser, so it uses sound waves to precisely dispense droplets into the destination plate with volumes as low as 2.5 nanoliters. And your input plate can be a 96 volt plate, meaning now that uh, you can have 96 regions as your sound wave. Input. And um, one of the key things is it's actually really perfect for DMSO dispensing. TKN D300E, it's like a printer, even looks like a printer, and it uses a similar technology to the Hewlett Packard in in inkjet dispensing just modified for reagents and even uses the cassettes as well. And it can dispense even up to the picoliter range. Again, very popular device for DMSO dispensing. And finally, we have the iDOT. And this is a relatively new device I've come across, which is really cool. It handles deep well plates, but even microscopic glass slides too. Very similar to the Echo in terms of droplet dispensing. But what it has here is that in your input plate, which can also be a nice well plate, if you have a dispensing channel that goes over the top, then you have the reagents go into the dispensing channel and then you have the channel arms go on top then to form a dispensing channeling arm and essentially then use the positive air pressure here to generate nanoliter droplets into a target plate. So the volumes can be again as low as four nanoliters with residual volumes now to be one microliter because it takes in everything from your source plate. And to give an eye on speed here again, it does 100 nanoliters per for nanoliter per plate in seven seconds. Okay. I've talked a lot about these different liquid dispensers, but there's one that I've missed. It is one of my favorite ones. So I have a video to show you this. Um, so one of my favorites are the Dragonfly Discovery here from SPT Lab Tech. And, and the biggest reason why I like it actually is speed of execution, but not just speed of execution, also speed in preparing the device. A user can really easily walk up, add their reagents to the reservoirs, as you can see there, and then the tips will just go down, pick up the reagents, and then immediately starts running. The plate goes underneath the tips, and then the tips can all dispense all at the same time, again, with different volumes. And then you can go down to 200 nanoliters and up to even four mils because of the higher tip capacity size. Dispensing of the volumes is also liquid class agnostic. It's non-contact positive displacement dispensing. And it really is one of the easiest standalone devices to work with because of how easy it is just to plan an experiment, walk up to it, you fill your reservoirs and literally away you go. So in terms of the first category of devices we'd like called flexible automation, this really is, this is one that kind of shines in that category. Again, used very heavily in drug discovery, even genomics, molecular biology, biochemical assays, and it has multiple configurations. So it can come with a, a PCR plate adapter. There's also a chilling reservoir block, and also some configurations come with an incubation lid as well. And so it's a really nice device for some flexible automation. Okay, so next category are the large liquid handlers, and these are the devices we see a lot, the TCANs, the Hamiltons, the Biomex, and for the latest Biomex DI series. Now they're large, which means they're capable of running much broader experiments, so acid development and a more high throughput, and also they can incorporate different multiple peripherals here. 
all of them pretty much contain internal robotic arm and configurations. Depending on the size of the liquid handler, some of them can even have three arms, such as the TCAM fluent here. And that means that you have the best of all worlds. You have the dispensing span eight, you have the multi churning arm for the 96 volt plate dispensing, and also a robotic gripper arm to grip plates. Talking about TCAM specifically, they even have a special configuration here where the robotic arm can actually interchange depending on where you want to grip the plate. So if you want to grip the plate from the top or if you want to grip the plate from the side, that's that there's an interchangeable gripping arm there. But at the bottom here, we have our smaller benchtop liquid handlers like the Gilson, the Flowbot One, the Agenant Bravo, and the Cyber Felix. Again, depending on the requirements and even the space or the budget, these are typically the kind of devices that we see a lot in the market. Now, the smaller devices do differ slightly from each other. Just to give you an example, if I talk about the Flowbot One, they have a deck that actually has a camera at the very bottom. And so users can actually put plates onto the deck and they can be visually seen by the software. And so that means you can even track where your plates are. You can scan the barcodes as well. And so each of these devices have their own sort of unique features. Very important distinction though, between a liquid dispenser and liquid handler is the liquid dispenser that I talked about really only has one plate, one, one destination plate and can only dispense into wells, but really fast. The liquid handlers though are a bit slower because of all the movements of the robotic arms, moving into positions to aspirate and dispense. And to compensate on that, on that lower speed is a has a diversity because of being able to aspirate. Liquid dispensers can't do mixing and they can't aspirate. They really only dispense. However, liquid dispensers can have that diversity applied when it comes into work cells where you have third party robotic arms as well to maybe take the plates away or storage and incubators. And that, that's how you can expand the use case of these, these liquid dispensers. So lab automation shortens the discovery timeline, bringing new medications to market much faster. That is the bottom line. If you aren't just drug discovery, you need to have lab automation, utilizing a lot of devices that I've already talked about. And there's a lot of different experiments you can do. I really mentioned biochemical assays, enzymatic assays, drug target identification validations, and there's many more. But essentially lab automation is really the part that allows a scientists to accelerate their experiments. So that covers drug discovery. There's a lot more I can talk about, but it will just take me hours here. So I'm going to move on. The next type of automation is really around specialized equipment where they are really fit for one particular application. And we see this a lot in bioprocessing. So bioprocessing is the next use case here. Bioprocessing it encompasses a lot of different processes here. And hopefully this chart is able to outline the steps, but essentially what it is, it's just the use of biological materials, such as cells to produce a product. And bioprocessing is really important and because it's really revolutionized industries like medicine and biotech in enabling the production of life-saving therapeutics and even vaccines as well, as we've seen in the crucial role of it during COVID. But it also continues to play a role in changing the way we do things, such as environmental. A company here called Uncommon, used to be called High Stakes, is really pioneering that technology with producing the cultured meats here. Bioprocessing is not just about medicines, but also overlaps into different areas here. One of the first things people think about when they hear bioprocessing is bioreactors, but actually it's more than bioreactors. We have upstream bioprocessing and downstream bioprocessing. Upstream is where you produce the bulk of the material and downstream is just more about purifying the product. There are two separate focuses here. But to briefly walk through the steps on the top left, we have that you may have some kind of cells that you have selected, which make a desired product. You put into bioreactors to scale up the process, you harvest and purify it. And then you may do some analytical tests to make sure the purified material actually works. And then you then run through a repackaging. So this is called formulation and bill before you actually ship out to, to where it needs to go. So let's go through the areas of where automation can be applied here. So we have upstream. And again, it involves the preparation and cultivation of your biological entities and, and cell lines or, or microorganisms. And so how a typical process looks here is first you characterize that starting material, pick the right cells. So there'll be a selection process. And because you're handing cells there, you have to make sure that the automation you pick can effectively move the cells around without the loss of viability. But also you need to ensure that the device has a way of, of ensuring the cells remain homogenous and hasn't actually sedimented into where it's located. And in this example, a really good use case for a good device is actually the surface flex. It has recently come out with a nice stirring mechanism that actually sits on top of, of, of the tubing and that enables your cells to continuously be homogenous and stops from sedimenting. 
I just gave an example of such effect. However, all the devices I mentioned do have ways of managing sales. You just have to tweak them. Once you've selected your sales, you may run a few transfection studies to ensure that you get some product at the end. And at this point, you probably use a liquid handler. The hit liquid handler can move your DNA to be transfected to the cells. And then the cells can be picked up and moved into, let's say, your cytomet in incubators. And then now the liquid handler will take over in splitting the cells every three or five days and continue to be monitoring. So that's where you could use a liquid handler for that. Now, let's say that all works. Now you're looking to actually maximize the yield of the product. So the next step would be to potentially look at media optimization and you will start doing media development, which involves multiple reactions, so multiple reagents and components. And what you're really looking to do is potentially use a dispenser because you're not really using live cells anymore, using reagents to do your dispensing. So really it's all about getting the starting material ready to scale up into your bioreactors and making sure the lab automation parts here can handle the live material. So now that you're ready, you can actually scale up to bioreactors. And that's where you start thinking about optimizing process control. You are going to control the conditions within this culture to enable the most amount of product produced or bulking the cells even further. And a bioreactor is literally just life support system because there's so many things that you can control. And I actually happen to have one right here. So what I'm going to do is momentarily stop sharing so that you can see the bioreactor in more detail. But the bioreactor I'm holding right now can hold around 250 mils. As you can see, it contains two, Im two impellers, which are used for stirring, and a cap that sits on top as well. And what happens is there's a sort of headstand that sits on top here to control the stirring. Now you can run microbial or mammalian cultures in these bioreactors. And you can tell the difference by just looking at the impeller sh shape. So mammalian uses these dual pitch impellers. We can see in these ones, uh, these are over called Russian impellers, and it's built like this for intense mixing. Microbial cultures can withstand higher stirring speed because they consume oxygen much faster. So stirring needs to be much higher to ensure that kind of full distribution of oxygen. And actually, you can easily tell if you're running a mammalian run when the biota gets contaminated because when you're monitoring oxygen, it immediately drops, and you see there's some drops of potential as contamination. We also have a pH probe. And that's obviously detecting pH real time. And uh, actually they detect pH and temperature readings every seven seconds. We then have red DO spot for measuring dissolved oxygen. And in terms of gassing, it can be done in two different ways. One of them is from the headspace. So you can gas it from the top. And this ensures that actually that the bubbles are kept down and there's no foaming because if you have foaming from your barrages, it creeps back up into the system. And that's where it can get clogged and your system completely fails. So the headspace gassing is important. The other side of gassing actually is gassing into the culture. So that will provide the oxygen to the culture much faster. And as I mentioned, if you're blowing gases into the culture, you get that kind of bubble formation here. There's also four extra bits of tubing. This is for feeding the bioreactor so you can have reagents such as glucose, or even just to control your pH and add different components as well here. And finally, an Amber 250 can handle 24 of these. 24 of these all running at the same time. It's a really awesome example of how a specialized bit of automation here has revolutionized upstream bioprocessing. A huge benefit of using these automation systems here is that the, uh, the Amber 250 has process control. And so let's take pH as an example. Now, pH can vary a lot depending on the life cycle of the cells. So for example, if your cells are going through the exponential phase, when the cells are growing, that means there'll be increased waste products. So increased lactic acid, if you're doing mammalian cells, and this can impact the pH, which can cause cell viability losses. So we want to be able to control that fluctuation. At the same time, if your cells are exponentially growing, then that means there's going to be a larger consumption use of oxygen. And that would mean you have to either pump more oxygen, but again, pumping more oxygen means you have to increase the flow rate. Increase the flow rate could mean, again, cell viability loss because of the high flow rate here. Amber 250 system is trying to control all of these different processes like pH, oxygen, all at the same time to ensure that your culture actually is working fine. The other side of the thing is, as I mentioned, the control bubbles and antifoam is, is added. So antifoam can be added through these tubings to control the bubble formation when it starts detecting that bubbles are being formed. So there is this laser that can actually pass through the bioreactor to see where there's any sort of refraction of light. And if that happens, then it loses bubbles and it'll start kicking in antifoam efficiency. 
So that's a lot. And hopefully a strong appreciation of bioregister system that is essentially live support for your cells as really enhanced the production of it. So going back into to my slides then, I've talked a lot around process control and, and the amplitude 50 here, but we can do DOE process control as well. So adjusting the different stirring reaction speeds and adjusting the flow rates to see what, which conditions really improve the production or bulk up the cells as efficiently as possible. Some of the bioreactors that can also exist, so there's not just amplitude 50 here, but there are also micro bioreactors, so they're pretty much plate-based. There's a nice one from Beckman called the Biolector XT micro bioreactor. With basically plate-based bioreactor systems here. If we go up in terms of volumes, then as I mentioned, there's the Amber 250s, but there's also the Amber 15s, which can hold 48 bioreactors, but in the 15 mil capacity. And then scaling up from there, we also have the Eppendorf system, so the Cyavario and also Aplicons. And even then, once we go into the manufacturing scale, we have the Biostat to get off from Sartorius. But the other side of automation, which we need to think about once we go into real time is, is process analytical technology or PAT. And that essentially basically is, is real time monitoring with, with these sensors and it facilitates enhanced process control. So imagine now you've been monitoring glucose thresholds, typically people take a sample and measure it offline. But what PAT can facilitate is you can actually detect the concentrations of glucose in real time and actually start putting in more glucose if it detects that there's a drop in the threshold. And one of the main ones that I've used here is Roman Spec, where it uses kind of light scattering techniques to actually again measure the concentration of these different substrates in your virus. The final one is bioprocess modeling and simulations. And a buzzword we hear a lot around is actually digital twin. Digital, digital twins are basically compute, computational models which simulate and then predict how your next bioprocess will be. And because let's say you ran three or four experiments using the same cells, there's a lot of data collected now. And we can use some algorithms and systems here to actually predict what your fifth one to be. It's really powerful because there's now faster process development and a huge amounts of cost savings. Each buyer to run is expensive and you are basically paying, paying for data. And so any quick uses of that data to facilitate the next run is going to be yeah, hugely impactful. The next side is downstream. And once you're going to harvesting the material, you want to actually purify it. And purification is essentially removing the impurities so that you have that pure concentrated product. And this step involves various techniques like filtration, chromatography, and centrifugation. And, and with, there are also specialist lab automation applications, say, such as the rubber columns, which is what I have one here. And they're essentially these columns from Replogen, which contains the 200 or 600 column volumes. And it is packed with resins to bind your proteins of interest here. Now, the reason why these are more specialized is because they're basically adapted to the TCAN and the TCRM setup, and the liquid handler with the fixed tips can peer through the columns. They can go through loading of samples, washing and collecting, and even actually calibrating and sterilizing these columns to be used for the next one. And this is entirely all handled by TCAN. Another application people would typically use is also filter plates. And if you have a high number of samples to load, but also using tips. So there are also tips out there, which are packed with resins. And um, the two companies I've heard of are Phi tips and also IMCS tips. And that essentially enables you to now run protein purification on any liquid handler that can control the tips there. If you go into higher volumes, then the actor is one of them to be used, which is very popular. After purification, you may run a few analytical experiments, such as ELISAs. If that's all, if that's all working well, then you would run the final step, which is the formulation of fill, and that's just using liquid handlers and, and, and large end-to-end workflow systems to get them ready to actually be shipped out. So that's bioprocessing. Really important to understand, actually, is it is a multi-stage process and lots of specialized lab automation involved to enable your experiments to be more efficient. Now, the final type of automation I want to talk about is integrated systems. And the one area which really heavily involves this is within genomics. So what happens in genomics? Essentially, it's just a use of high throughput technologies and approaches to sequence, assemble, and analyze your DNA and RNA molecules. And these techniques allow researchers to really understand the genetic content of their organisms, provide insights into genetic variations. And again, one that's really puts genomics really high into the field is when COVID happened because people had to very quickly screen for variants and that's where their genomics and automation was involved. Now, right now, after all the slides I've talked about, you're probably already thinking that and see applying lab automation is going to improve efficiency. So I'm not going to go and talk about too much here, 
But just to talk about some of the applications you can use under the umbrella of genomics is around uh, high throughput library prep, PCR, NGS, genotyping, and you know, there's a lot more. But essentially the steps that are involved include multiple sample types and different methods such as sample loading, sequencing, extraction, and also reading as well. At the same time, theory can be applied because you want to optimize these reaction conditions. As mentioned, genomics is more than just liquid handling. It's a myriad of different peripherals and a lot of them can be meshed into one. But some devices will operate as a standalone. And that means that you actually require a, a robotic arm, such as the one on the top here, top left here, to actually bring the plate over to different devices. Or there's one out there, which is a mobile robotic device from Biosera. These are pretty cool because they basically take your plate, they can then move over to a different lab and actually then put your plate onto the dental source. There are also some solutions that are more, more focused into an in-house solution and, and really small as well. So there's one from the SBT lab tech called the Firefly. And this is basically a very powerful device that has liquid handling and also liquid dispensing in one, but also heating, shaking, and incubating. It's basically all in one device. And it really utilizes the space, the deck here, which you can actually shuttle left and right to expose different components at the bottom. And then there are some vendors out there that really build out the entire solution for you, such as the one at the bottom in the middle here from Perkin Elmer, which is a work cell, and also one from Automata. These are fully automated end-to-end -end solutions, and they're really built for scalability and bringing all these different peripherals together with robotic arms, moving them along. So automation in genomics is all about efficiency, which can aid in discovering those really rare genetic variants because of sequencing so many samples, help with things like cancer genomics, if you're trying to rapidly sequence these tumor genomes to identify therapeutic targets and even personalized treatment options, and even useful biomarker discovery. Platforms can enable discovery of these biomarkers much faster, which can be used for disease diagnosis, prognosis, and even when you're monitoring treatments of responses. So these are typically used in hospital environments here. I like to talk about the parts that is the constant battle with automation scientists and automation engineers and overcoming barriers, trying to influence an adoption of automation to actually everyone. Sometimes automation was brought up and then we all got excited, but then it never happens. What actually happens is you become the automation. You become the person that continuously pets away in the lab and the person who actually moves the plate around different labs as well and moving the plates to different peripherals. So essentially all the talk around automation was stopped and you became that person. So I'd like to address some of the barriers here very briefly. And these barriers do limit the widespread of adoption and the implementation of lab automation. And yes, on the picture on the right here, this is an X. It's a symbol that represents do not use do not come over, barrier, it's not Twitter. But by the way, there was a really good post from the F on Twitter showing the Twitter bird logo evolving, then suddenly extinct with the next. I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, but anyway, back to lab automation. The biggest one, of course, is price. And we know there's consumables, there's maintenance, and this will enable scientists to think about, okay, should I invest in it? But you need to think of it as a long-term investment because automation enables the scientists to work on numerous projects, not just one now for, most, for, for many months, it's multiple projects over many months. So you can make more discoveries. Uh, so the investment actually enabling your organization to do work more efficiently. What well, the other barrier is around uh, complexity. So these systems are complex and they will involve multiple robotic systems, multiple software. So it can take time to train as uh, so there is that sort of technical challenge, but actually what we see here is this is the reason why most scientists end up picking up the pipette to do things manually because of this software challenge and this technical challenge here. However, vendors are recognizing this and they are some, a lot of them are changing their software to accommodate this. But instead what we can do is grow the team, hiring automation engineers so they can figure out how to handle the tech stack. This will bridge that skill gap. But the other option also is to invest in your staff and train them to use these systems because it keeps them happy so that they can continue to learning. And also they won't leave, but there also one also important fact is if you have automation, you need someone to run it. And so investing in this staff also is, is really beneficial for their kind of career development too. Change management. And this is one that also raffles some better. We all had that one person who is resistant to change, very accustomed to manual methods. Instead, we need to foster a culture, which embraces change, embraces these new technologies, and we need to keep innovating. So we need to think about all the cool things you can do if you have a robot in your lab, all the cool experiments you can do. 
You, know, you have time for conferences. You have time to gain valuable insights in the industry. We could even meet our conference one day, right? If you have your robotic system running your experiment for you. Another side is biological. And it's a very unique one because there are going to be some unique experiments that are very difficult to automate. But with careful thought, it can be done. Device just needs to be tweaked. Uh, liquid classes need to be adjusted. And actually, by the way, we do have a whole webinar based around physical practicalities to automation, such as liquid class, liquid class optimization. So do stay tuned to that. And finally, space. Space is an issue because some labs may not have that much physical space. But as we've seen today, there are a lot of smaller devices that can get you started. So we talked about the three types of automation and actually sometimes when you're trying to do so many, that can be a barrier too. So what we need to do is explore further how we can automate these, uh, these kind of very complex experiments. Because ultimately, in my opinion, all of biosciences R&D needs to be automated. There are going to be barriers, but we just need to overcome them one by one. The benefits, hopefully now they're really obvious to you. We have increased throughput. Experiments are reproducible and traceable. We have better precision and accuracy for our experiments. Walk away time so we can get to those conferences and network because that plays a huge part in a scientist's career. Automation allows flexibility, but also automation increases the fair data capture principles. And it's not something we touch upon in this, but uh, applying automation enables experiments to be much more findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's what fair really means. And finally, the, the long-term ROI. All the benefits to lab automation and with full utilization, and I really mean full utilization because as I mentioned in the few slides back, there's no point bringing in lab automation, but still running in that sort of OFAT matter. So if you apply full utilization of your experiments, you get to run complex experiments. So such as theory, and, and by doing that, you'll be, you'll be able to see results of these here. So four to six months of drug discovery, 115% improved assay quality, potentially more conditions mapped. But also a reduction in spend, 50% reduction in spend. And why? Because if you're running things manually and OFAT, you're running lots of experiments, which means that you can be making mistakes along the way. You're rerunning things. You're reusing a lot of the consumables. If you're using automation and you run it just the one experiment and you have less errors, so actually what you're doing is spending less on the consumables. So that's why we get to see a reduction. These metrics have been captured from our own use cases as well when we've transitioned from, from manual to automation. So hopefully now you have heard the value automation can bring. So what's next? Start automating experiments now. Really, that's really the only thing I can advise on. Start right now. Start by identifying your specific needs, defining clear goals and objectives, research available technologies, and start small and gradually scale up because everybody has to start somewhere. And all you do is basically refine and optimize and continuously improve. It's also really important to start establishing the automation from the ground up and have that in, in, in the culture so you can also adopt flexibility and adaptability. But also think about data tracking because lab automation ultimately leads to increased throughput. So if you don't have any sense of where your samples are going, if you're not tracking that, then that's another challenge that you have to address. So having that already thought about is important. And finally, don't rush it because lab automation is a journey. There's going to be things you tweak along the way, add more to your process. So really enjoy this, this journey of lab automation. Biology really is an ever evolving landscape and uh, researchers are really continuously looking to drive and push these boundaries, looking to uncover the mysteries of life and also revolutionize healthcare. Now automation in the biosciences is an absolute game changer because it's accelerated so many more discoveries and it's paving the way for entirely new frontier of research where scientists can actually unleash their creativity on the design of the experiments, while the technology, so the technology of different vendors, handles all of the petting, handles all of the kind of mundane tasks. And on top of this, automation is going to be central in, in data and the AI revolution the biosciences here. And that's because we are now in this rapidly advancing era where the vision of that massively automated powerful experiments are going to become the norm, and it's going to be more attainable than ever. So that's the end of my slides, really. One thing I want to point out is do talk to us. If you haven't connected with, with me or LinkedIn yet, uh, please do. And I'm happy to schedule one-to-one -to, -one to just chat about the automation. Or if you want to understand more about the devices that I've talked about. Alternatively, reach out to Synthase. That's also where you can find me if you have any other generic questions. And I mentioned theory a lot. 
And if you're wondering what it is or where, how to start, we have a full webinar masterclass series on it. So do check it out. And as I mentioned, I am a huge advocate for theory and automation because the two really go hand in hand. If you're running these complex experiments, you need automation because there's no way to do, for example, an eight factor run three to five levels on a three, four wheel player to try and do five replicates. And if you try and do this manually, it's pretty insane. Automation is there to enable that to be possible. So that's the end. Thank you very much for listening and taking part. And I open it back to Marcus and open up the floor for questions and some interesting discussions around the automation. Thank you very much, Daniel. I think that was a fantastic whistle stop tour through a huge amount of the automation ecosystem and what it can do for the biosciences. We've got a load of different questions coming in. We're blatantly not going to get our way through all of them, but we'll do our very best to crack through as many as we can. So the first one's actually a great one to go with, and I think it's a really good introduction to how we might get started with automation in general. And that's how do you go about transferring assays? But I guess from that, we can think about any method from a manual setup to an automated setup. Where do you start and how do you handle the differences between speed and reagent use, assuming you already own a robotic system such as a TCAN fluent? And that's from Randall. If you already have a TCAN system and you're running things manually and you want to translate it to the TCAN, first of all, you'll probably have some kind of SOP. So really just go to the TCAN and start actually writing down these different steps here. And then once you're starting to write these steps down, you can actually then see how the time savings can be done because the TCAN actually will show you where is it going to go to aspirate, where is it going to pick up the tips. And then you need to think about in your experiment, what are the different considerations that need to be put in place to make it effective? Is it speed that you're trying to optimize? Is it the increase of throughput? Because one of the things, as I mentioned before in lab automation is what is the reason for actually starting it? Are you trying to reduce the errors? Are you trying to increase throughput, trying to optimize on speed, or you're trying to actually apply DRE? Because if you are running things manually, then you are probably doing OFET. I used to do this too, back in my days. As a TCAN is actually perfect for DRE, especially when you have these sort of sophisticated devices, TCAN, Hamilton's, et cetera. So I would definitely say, yeah, again, what is the reason for going into automation? And if that is the case for increasing throughput, start small by just putting in the different steps into it and then just to start from there really. Yeah. And often what we've found is that you can't just directly transfer a manual method. Like there will have to be some form of adaptation. If you think about the kind of things that human operators can do when they're pipetting, then they're really quite sophisticated. You have you can be holding something up and visually looking at where the liquid is, moving your pipette as you do naturally, just we alter the speed at which we pipette without even thinking about it in order to get the most accurate and consistent pipetting. And so you need to be able to replicate those kind of capabilities on an automated device. It will do exactly what you say it to no more, no less. So there's a lot of considerations there about exactly how you're moving the liquids about, for example, but at the same time, the benefits are massive. And once you have dialed in on the best way of doing things, you will, that piece of equipment will be doing those very robustly time and time again. So it's certainly worth the effort, but yeah, I'd echo what Daniel says, start with a small amount, check that it's do, operating as it should optimize those different transfers, those different mixes and whatever you need to be doing, and then look at scaling. Okay. Next question, a very specific one. Would you have any example of DNA or plasmid cloning automation? So I've got a few of these, if you. Yeah, that's a good one. I've heard one from Kingfisher. And so I think that's quite a popular device for that. I think that there's really quite a few specific devices out there. And I think this really falls into that category I mentioned about specialized lab automation, which is you know, really does that sort of yeah. unique application. Yeah. I mean, for the DNA purification, definitely those things that Daniel just mentioned, the Kingfisher, I've seen it used a fair bit, but if you talk about the whole process, so from DNA assembly, the transformation into E. coli getting colony, plating out, getting colonies, picking colonies. There are bits of equipment and methods that you can use throughout that entire thing. And a lot of people who have actually done automation across those, we ourselves have done this early days at Synthase and just a generic liquid handler can actually do a huge amount of this amount of that process. We found including plate out, if you use dilutions, you can make sure you get to single colonies and then yeah, colony pickers are available, like either very big systems. Um, QPix or down to a smaller systems like Pixel from Singer Instruments. And so like there, there are bits of automation for all of those parts. But again, think about those parts, which you think are most important for your process to automate, start there and then move forward. That's going to be our fairly consistent advice. 
How do you bridge the gap between all those devices and control softwares to run the experiments you want? And that's from Simon. That's a good question. I'm going to be a bit cheeky here, cheeky here and recommend some things because then that's actually something that we do very well in uh, bridging that gap. But in, in, a, in an honesty, really, it's just start training up on what the software actually does. And we're always going to get this. Just take the TCANs, for example, uh, they're going to keep releasing powerful liquid handlers. And uh, powerful liquid handlers means a change in the software to really adapt to that. So we had the TCAN Evos with EvoWare, and the same would apply to even the Hamiltons and Firemix as well. So software is always going to be a part where we need to keep upskilling ourselves. But I'd say that if you want to understand how they connect with each other, then some people start looking into APIs or look at a sort of overarching system to look after all of the different systems, if that makes sense. Yeah. And there's quite a few bits of software out there that might look at how to integrate and schedule between diverse kit. So I'm thinking about companies like Hi-Res Bio Solutions or Biocero, who make a product called Green Button Go, or Automata, who make both hardware and software. A lot of these players make both hardware and software to, to try and resolve this problem. The thing is, before you go down that route, though, I again would implore you to think about exactly why you want to be automating. Often, the goal for people seems to be to go directly to end-to-end -end automation and try to get everything as automated as possible. And this is certainly, I think, all of our ultimate vision. As you're going through that process of introducing automation to your workflows and to your organization, managing that change management, I would suggest don't try and take that leap all the way there, all in one go. Think about what the most important aspects are for why you want to automate and concentrate on those first. And then maybe this is a perfect question that we'll have to wrap up on, but maybe a cautionary tale. Where have you seen automation rollouts fail? I think. The immediate thing that comes to my mind is if you jump straight in to automation without thinking what exactly you want to do. So if we take into asset development, for example, before you think thought about the number of reagents you're looking to do, the throughput, you immediately purchase the lab equipment because you thought it was cool. And that's where we see cases where it typically fails because you haven't thought it through properly. There are also cases where the experiments itself are quite bespoke and, and the device just doesn't suit it. So that's where we see everything spill. On the flip side, uh, these devices are very powerful and they're tweakable. So there's always ways, if it, even if it does fail, there's always a way to actually make it work. And it's through liquid class optimizations, whether it's through different ways of training to utilize the software. So I would say if you are in the case of equipment failing, I would say um, don't worry. And there's always a way around it. And I'm uh, just going to, again, break down the steps of those barriers. Yeah, I think that's certainly from a technical perspective, I completely agree with you, Daniel. But what I've seen in a lot of places, though, is more to do with the human aspect and political buy-in and that kind of thing. Again, this is the sort of cautionary tale about don't go too big too quickly, because often people will have this vision of a huge end-to-end -end automated system, which can get initial political backing, get made, um, but it's hugely complex, maybe quite difficult to get to work. And then if you have a key person move on or something like that, then I've seen so many of these things end up as white elephants, especially when you go around bigger companies. I've often just on the way to a meeting group or whatever, you walk down a corridor and you look through the windows into the labs and it's just row after row of automation that's just sat there in some kind of automation graveyard. We like that is a, a cautionary tale, but like Daniel says that the technical solutions are there, think to your change management and to your how you're going to be introducing this to your organization as much as the technical side. And I think then you could go out against these times when the things haven't gone so well in the past, we're going to have to end there. Our next session, we're going to be looking into the physical practicalities that need to be considered when doing biology with automation. So this is actually really diving a fair bit deeper after this intro session into the technicality specifically of how we'd be transferring and mixing liquids accurately. In all our experience, sometimes it really comes down to this right, is how could we make sure that liquid, the liquid handling is actually happening as it should do. And I alluded to that a little bit in one of the question answers. It can be a real challenge. Essentially, what we're looking to do is to share our knowledge of about the last 10 years of using automation collectively as a team at Synthase to help you get automations up and running. We hope you enjoy the talk and we look forward to seeing you for our next webinar in September. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.